Joy Wassel is the founder and president of Decisions, Choices, and Options Incorporated. She is a licensed secondary educator and nationally certified sexual risk avoidance education specialist. She has been working um, in Tennessee for a long time and when she moved to Alabama, she found out about Eagle Forum and that we were into this sort of thing in education and protecting children. And so we got, she mm -hmm. called me and we got together and mm -hmm. started working on a bill. That was a couple of years ago. It didn't go anywhere at first, but my goodness, I can't believe it's five years. <laughs> um, we have made great strides. She mm -hmm. speaks, um, she's just very knowledgeable on this subject. And like Teresa Hubbard said this morning, what they're doing to our children, this is a form of terrorism. This is a form of just mm -hmm. completely taking over our country. It is a national security issue yeah. also, mm -hmm. as you've heard many times today. And so we are so excited uh, for you to be presenting. Thank you Thank for you. being here. Yeah. And okay. go, go to it. All right. Well, I guess we saved the best subject for last, right? We're going to talk about sex now. Um, <laughs> So, for those of you who stayed, um, does it matter? I mean, clearly from what we have heard today, all of these, I'm just going to sum up. Malia, a good friend, um, said that it's us against the porn industry. And Les, this morning, said that we've got to protect our kids from the gambling addiction. And then Pat shared that SEL says that parents are roadblocks. Not parents, but their roadblocks to their children's um, well-being. And then Angela said, all good legislation takes time. And Scott said that the Marxist plan to destroy the U.S. is fully here in Alabama. And so I want to link all of those topics together with the final session we have today and talk about, yes, absolutely it matters what they're teaching our children about sex. And so the education organization that God called me out of the classroom, I was a public school high school teacher, and I was called out of the classroom after one of my close friends, 15-year-old daughters, had an unexpected pregnancy and all of the trauma and tragedy that, it, that she walked through during during that time as a 15 year old trying to make the very best decision for herself for her child and so as a high school teacher it really broke my heart that there was so much false information and outdated information that was pushed on this young girl trying to do the right thing she was not going to have an abortion when she decided to choose adoption and even chose a wonderful family in the community that we lived in she was mocked and bullied every day at her high school by classmates and teachers and they would many times say i would have an abortion before i would give my baby away and so those kind of things just lived in my heart for a long time and finally i realized i was being called to do something about it and if i had known then in 2002 what it was going to end up being today i would have went oh no oh, no you got to get another girl so this is what we do this is our mission statement we believe that all children all children deserve to have sexual risk avoidance education that leads them to optimal health not risk reduction health not here's a condom here's birth control optimal health is to avoid risky behaviors and so that's the kind of sex ed that is the only kind of good sex ed and so we've been very um, successful in our operations all over Tennessee and in Alabama. We work primarily through the pregnancy resource centers all across the state. We've trained them and then they go into their communities to teach our curriculum. This is the goal. This is from the Brookings Institute. And when I speak to business entities like the Chamber of Commerce or Kiwanis Club, uh, whatnot, I always talk about, you know, what we teach them in abstinence and sexual risk avoidance education is teaching skills that you as a business owner, a parent, a future spouse, want your child to know. It's self-regulation skills. It's delaying gratification. It's controlling things that you are being told by everyone in your world you don't have to control. Do whatever you want, do however you want, with whomever you want, and that is why our kids are in such chaos because they've been told that for so many years. And so this proves that what we teach is correct. If you choose to graduate from high school and you do the things that that requires, and then after high school graduation, um, then you go into either college or trade school, whatever, whatever your level of education is, once you finish that level of education, then you get full-time employment 
and get married after the age of 21 and then have children. And I said this to the governor of Tennessee about three years ago when we were talking about poverty prevention. I asked him if he would be interested in something that could reduce Tennesseans down to less than 5% of our state living, this is when I still live back in Tennessee, 5% of our state living in the, under the poverty level. And he said, well, absolutely. And I said, we do it every day in middle schools and high schools all over this state in Alabama. And fortunately, God called my husband and I back home to Alabama. I grew up in the Shoals area, left after college, moved to Nashville, spent 39 years there. And I'm very, very glad to be back home in sweet home Alabama, working with such wonderful people and all the entities in this room. Because this is what we believe. And this is where the mental health crisis in children and youth right now is off the charts. I had two phone calls yesterday. One from a lady in Pinson, Alabama, a grandmother, who found out that her 16-year-old granddaughter is suicidal. And then another one from another lady who just discovered that her child has told her teacher that she's gay. Not the parent, she told the teacher that she's gay. Um, we believe that when our kids understand their true value and worth, that it's gonna change the way, not only that they see themselves, but the way they see the world and the way they interact. And so we've got to get back to that. In Sumner County, Tennessee, where this program started in 2002, between 2002 and 2019, there was a 65.5% decrease in teenage pregnancy. So we know that it works. We know it works. We've got the proof. We've got the numbers. And that led to a $1.25 million reduction in state, federal, and local dollars going to support all of the things that have to support teenage moms and their babies. So that's a huge impact, not only on the state of Tennessee and, and local governments as well. And so also there's a cost because what we do is prevention education. So we're preventing things from happening by teaching students skills. And you know, when we taught in inner city Nashville, people would say, well, why are you going there? They're, they are not going to follow your advice. They're not going to take what you're teaching. That was absolutely not true. And I remember speaking to a legislator. One of my first encounters with a legislator in this state was when he told me, um, Eric, if Eric's still in the room, um, I don't know. There you are. We started on this in October of 2019, did we not? And I remember you telling me it was going to take two or three years. And I went, we don't have two or three years, Eric. And it's taken five. So, <laughs> but COVID, you know, all that. So what we do is prevention education is to go in and teach them new information that maybe in most cases they've never heard that they don't have to live in this poverty cycle that they've been in their whole lives. Or just because their mama and their grandmama and their great grandmama were teen moms, they don't have to be teen moms. They can make better choices and they're worth those choices. And so it's $48, give or take, to educate one student. But to incarcerate one individual in Coffee County, Tennessee, it was $16,732 to the Coffee County uh, system and generally speaking across the u.s it's about twenty one thousand dollars a year to take care of a teen mom and her child for that first year after birth so we can spend the twenty one thousand dollars times however many years or we can spend the sixteen thousand seven hundred or we can spend forty eight dollars a year um, on a child to give them prevention education and so all of that to say we do have a pretty good track record, um, a 31% decrease in number of students who see abortion as a favorable option. That's huge, y'all. That's huge. Um, and 52% of students understand that the direct choice between choosing sexual abstinence and success in life are correlated because it is teaching them those self-regulation skills and all of the things that they need. And plus, they just have a, I saw girls in my, my little workroom every day when I was teaching high school that they'd made poor choices and they really didn't like that they had been pushed into sex or they felt like they'd been guilted into it and all of that sort of thing. And it just had a mental health effect on their lives. And so there's just so many things that we want to make sure that they understand there are better ways. And this is our vision, the ministry that I run, this is our vision is to see all of the entities that come around our children and youth they're all speaking in the same voice and we're not allowing negative 
voices to come in. And so that's what we see. It starts with parents. Parents are the number one most important entity in this graph. The church, the community, any community organizations from sports to dance, whatnot. Um, any organization that's allowed in their schools should be vetted to be saying the same thing. And then the school. So that's our vision. That's what we hope. And we, we hope that that's the vision of everyone. I'm pretty sure it is in here. Now this is what's happened over the last few years because when I was a high school student at Brooks High School in Killen, Alabama. Nobody in that circle was saying anything different than my mom and dad were, our church was, my school, and all of those organizations that I belong to. They were all speaking in one voice. That is not at all the case anymore. And so now we see family destruction, cyberbullying that happens 24-7. We do an entire program with middle school students about all of the online dangers from predators to sextortion and all the things. Um, we teach parents that, gender confusion. Look at all the things that our kids are having to deal with now. It's an absolute disaster. This is what happens when you don't vet people. Because last April, and this is so funny because I met the mom at the Trustful Eagle Forum event back in January, and I'm driving home from being on Greg Davis's Priority Talk radio show talking about this group, Alabama Campaign for Adolescent Sexual Health. I've known about them for years. I've been doing what I do for 23 years. Every state in the country has a group like ACASH. They're funded by, affiliated with, and partnered with Planned Parenthood and some of these other entities you're going to see in just a minute. So I get this picture on my phone as I'm pulling into my house, um, my driveway at Hartzell, and I think it's a joke because I've just been on the radio and I'm thinking somebody heard me and they're sending this picture. It was a mom that didn't know I was on the radio, and she said, who are these people and why were they at my kid's school? And I'm like, Oh my word. And if you zero in, which you can't right there, but you can see that, you know, Pat, you talked about parent to roadblocks. One of those flyers on that table had a QR code on it that said if your parents are not affirming the gender or pronouns that you want to use, scan this QR code and we'll connect you with an adult that can help you. Can you say parental bypass? Okay. This is just the beginning. These people are, I mean, you just have to understand, y'all. You don't no negotiate with a toddler, you don't negotiate with a terrorist, and you don't negotiate with evil people. These people are evil. Um, and all you got to do is, and, and that's the thing, you know, if I was a classroom teacher and I invited Pat Ellis to come speak to my students, I would have thoroughly investigated you before I let you step foot in my classroom. Because I would want to know that you weren't going to violate anything. These people were not investigated. And so that happened. And um, as a result, we were able, these are just some of their literature. And the kids took these pictures, y'all. The kids knew this wasn't right. They knew it was violating the parent standards. And so it says on one of the flyers, supportive teachers save lives. And what that said went on to say that if your teacher isn't affirming your gender or your pronoun usage, then she could cause one of your classmates to commit suicide. I mean, what is, this was a ninth grade kid too that took the picture. So what are we telling our kids? Well, this is what the Alabama Campaign for Adolescent Sexual Health, health known as ACASH, um, on their 2023 policy priorities for the legislature um, said they want mandatory comprehensive sexual health education in all Alabama public schools and to create accountability measures to ensure that all schools are teaching it. They want it kindergarten through 12th grade. You can go to their website, it's still on there. They haven't changed it for 2024. Um, they want it to be gender inclusive with all sexual orientation. So that's who these people are. The fact that they were allowed in a school is unbelievable to me. But I don't think that's the only thing because we just heard from a school yesterday in St. Clair County that we're pretty sure these people were at their middle school too last year. Um, this is policy agenda number six for ACASH. And it says to implement child protection policies and minimize the impact of parental rights extremism. Those are just two of their six that are their policy goals. And so they were at the legislature last year, I think on the last day of session, and this was the slick marketing campaign that they were putting on the desk of most of the legislators, and it had all their policy information and all about comprehensive sex education and how great it is, and all Alabama students should have that. If you want to know more about where these people come from, you can go to uh, Pastor Jack Hibbs from Chino Hills um, Calvary Chapel. 
he's a pastor, and look at part 43 with Seth Gruber. That's the best explanation I've ever heard of where all of this garbage came from and who it came from, and it goes back to um, the 1920s. This was the birth of the sexual revolution in the 1920s. We had Margaret Sanger, Seth Gruber on that Jack Hibbs um, show goes into detail about who Margaret Sanger really was and I thought I knew her. I've been doing pro-life work my whole entire life. I thought I knew who this lady was. I didn't know that she was affiliated and close to Hitler. Had very close ties to him. I didn't know a lot of that stuff. Um, so this guy, Wilhelm Reich, in the 1920s, he actually coined the phrase sexual revolution. He's a Marxist. So this ties into a lot of the things we've talked about today because he believed that a Marxist utopia could not be achieved until we eradicated religion, that Western societies had to be hollowed out from within by destroying the family. Fatherless children do not attend church. That would remove the church's influence. Um, normalizing all sorts of sexual activity and perversion would create fatherless children and that sex education would divest parents of their moral authority. So that's where the root of all of these ACASH type groups comes from. Now these are the people that are behind sex education at the national level. Now this is very, very, um, it's deceitful. There is, there's no such thing as national sexuality education standards. But these things are on, and I talked to my Moms for Liberty group in Madison um, last week, and I said, why does Moms for Liberty have that as the national sexuality education standards? No state has endorsed this. It's SECUS, which stands for Sexuality Information Education Council of the U.S. It was founded by Mary Calderon. She was the medical doctor at Planned Parenthood. She left to go found this educational entity. And they now have for their tagline, they're not seek us anymore, they're sex ed for social change. They changed that about four or five years ago, right before COVID. Look at all the people that are affiliated. And if you watch the Seth Gruber interview with Jack Hibbs, he's gonna tie all those people neatly together and show you how they are all behind the destruction of our country, our families, and our children. And that's the only goal that they have. Um, so anybody on this list, you need to run fast from them. Glisten started under the Obama administration when his Secretary of Education, Arne Duncan, who was an openly homosexual man, um, started implementing gay, lesbian, straight education networks in all the schools and then the GSA clubs that we talked about earlier. Um, advocates for youth, don't they sound like a nice group? Okay, they're not. They're absolutely horrid. Um, I had one of their leaders speak to me. I didn't know who they were back in 2010 when we were having this national uh, teen group come and speak at a conference and we were bringing all of these kids in and I thought all these you know, youth serving organizations in Nashville would love to partner with us. And I walked in with my flyers and everything and to see if they would get their kids there and he said, uh, no, no, no we're, we're, we're not in line with you. I was like, advocates for youth. I better go look them up. And so I found out who they were. ETR is the publishing arm of Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood is the largest producer of comprehensive sex education in the country. And Seth Gruber also shows you how to tie all of that back to Planned Parenthood in any sex ed curriculum that is comprehensive in the country. Um, Playboy Foundation, I didn't know this, but Hugh Hefner was a student of Alfred Kinsey's at Indiana University. And so they're just, it's this tangled web, human rights campaign, we could go on. And so SECUS has issued a warning bill about hostile sex education bills in seven states. And I went, uh-oh, okay, we better look at that. Um, and so it's in Kentucky and Georgia and Hawaii and Iowa and Missouri and Virginia. Which I said, well, are they not upset about ours, Susan? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> okay, because I don't know yet. And I sent them an email back to uni and Becky and all them. I'm like, their head's going to explode when they see yours. <laughs> They're going to die. Um, there's their little bio about who they are, Sex Ed for Social Change, 1964, when they came around. But anyway, they're talking about how all these horrible sexual risk avoidance education bills that are coming in saying, no, you can't come in and, and teach radical comprehensive sex ed in our state, that that's really, really junk science is what it says in this bill uh, or in this article. Now, adolescent pregnancy prevention programs in the state of Alabama have been funded by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services for many years, and we're still trying to get that information. And I think 
Eric's doing something because we issued a FOIA and we have nothing back from Department of Public Health in Alabama about what types of programs they're using. We know for a fact that two of the programs, if you will open up your um, notebook and pull out this ACASH flyer and turn it over to the back, I want everybody to look at the back of this flyer because I want you to be shocked. I gave these out to pastors in Morgan County last week and I walked away feeling a little bad because my dad's a retired pastor in Morgan County and he's 86 years old and I kind of freaked out thinking, I just gave somebody's dad that's my dad's age this information. But this is what they want to teach to 6th through 12th graders in comprehensive sex ed. Um, these are two of the curriculum that have been approved by the Alabama Department of Public Health and taken funds to teach in our state. Um, to the tune of about $1.6 million in many cases. Now this is the problem because what we're doing is we're seeing the grooming of children. We're seeing the grooming in all the things you've heard today. This is the Gallup poll. Look at this Gallup poll to see that in 2014, Gen Z, which is the current generation of young people that are in college and in you know uh, elementary, middle, and high school, on this identifying as LGBTQ chart for um, Gallup, they didn't even show up in 2014. In 2017, they didn't show up. In 2020, they are about 16% of the population of Gen Z said they were identifying as LGBTQ. And then 2022, it's 19.7%. Because of all of this that's coming all to them, um, we can do this. We can go over and you know scream and yell at the school boards, and I don't say that that's not a bad thing, but it's probably not going to do a whole lot. Um, I think that what was read earlier was most effective, being very respectful and doing things that way. Or we can pass laws to make sure that our state says, oh, no, not in our state. That's not going to happen. And so in 2019, Eric and I had our first meeting about getting the Alabama sex ed law going, and it's 2023, it was going to be attached to the Divisive Concepts Bill, which never got out of committee. So here we are, and now we have Representative Susan DeBose is sponsoring the Alabama, I don't know what it's going to be called, we don't have a number yet, it hadn't been dropped, um, the Alabama Sex Ed uh, Bill. And these are some of the talking points, and I can email those to you, or you can pick them up on our table back there right as you go out. It looks just like this with Susan's logo on it. Um, it's going to require parental notification 14 days prior, gives the parents the right to opt out. Every school district will have to have a copy of what they're teaching at the school where the parents can see it. It prohibits any curricula from supporting, demonstrating, or pro providing access to contraceptives, abortion, graphic sexuality, explicit material, or normalizes any form of teen sex. The advantages of avoiding and eliminating risks of non-marital teen sex and the lifelong emotional, physical, and um, educational uh, impact of teen sexual activity, that sexual abstinence is the only 100% way of preventing unintended pregnancies and STDs, STIs, and HIV. Um, to provide the skills and knowledge to help children make decisions. We, we teach them healthy dating activities that don't involve anything that could go into a sexual area. Um, we give them ideas about what healthy relationships look like, what toxic ones look like, dating violence, all those kinds of things. Um, medically accurate information about real life usage. See, here's what the other side does. They says, well, you got to talk about condoms. And that's the conversation I had with a representative about three years ago when he said that two of the members of the Alabama legislature said that their, their children in their district had to have condoms because if not, they would all be pregnant. And I just said his name very calmly and I said, that's the most discriminatory thing I've ever heard in my life. You're saying that either A, they don't deserve to know that there are healthy skills and healthy life choices they can make that will lead them to a path of success that maybe they've never seen in their family of origin. Or you don't think they are smart enough to learn it. They either don't deserve it or they're not smart enough. And that's what that says. If you think they just have to have condoms and birth control, you're saying they can't make good choices. So then why do we bother educating them? Okay. Um, we we're going to provide factual information about youth facing unintended pregnancy, the benefits of raising children within the context of marriage. All of this is in Susan's bill. It's going to restrict, this is so good y'all, this is why their heads are going to fly off, literally. <laughs> G, uh, restricts any content that seeks to encourage teen sex. Local schools may not use any individual go back to the image of the ACASH people, any individual or organization to assist in sex education that performs 
provides referrals, funding, or advocacy for abortion. They're not going to be allowed in the school. So that's going to get back, that's going to get rid of all the bad players. And then these are just some of the concepts. You can read this. The bills back. I mean, the uh, talking points are back there. And then um, always, state education, Department of Education has standards that have to be covered in health education. And guess what? Our standards for sexual risk avoidance align with state standards. So that means what we're going to be saying has to be taught to the students is what aligns with the State Department of Education. But here's what I know from working with the Tennessee Department of Education. Sometimes you have to make them align. Sometimes you have to remind them of what those alignments are. So this is where we all come together as concerned parents, grandparents, um, pro-life, conservatives, is that we have to understand that when you hear the word comprehensive sex education, you have to do everything you can possibly do to stop that. And you have to know that Planned Parenthood and these other organizations are working very hard with billions of dollars behind them to do this. So they'll be at the Capitol. They'll be in Susan's office. I'm sure she's going to see them. Um, these are some other things. I think my time is up. But it's time that we bring all of this um, into the forefront of what we're talking about as churches. Pastors need to be talking about this. And all of us need to be working together. Okay, that's it. Amen. Now we'll go to <laughs> The doctor has a question. Dr. Stuart Tankersley, if y'all don't know him, he is a great COVID doc. He's one of the concerned doctors. He's a buddy of our national. He's a buddy of Highway in the Montgomery area, and we're so glad you're here. But next question. Yeah, I like to think that we're anti-COVID from other sides for this. There you go. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, you have talked a lot about how the national, how this is being forced nationally. I think that it's important for people to understand there are a dozen or so big meals in the state. I think the one big meal that's ran the whole program over the last four years more than any other is the Hospital Association. They've been so being UAB, and they have been a dominant force in the state the last four years, and I think there are several re reasons for that. And I think they're central to this issue that you're talking about because I think they're that the center for that agenda, the whole army agenda. Uh, for our state, and I uh, think that, uh, for example, we need to go right at them. And for ex one thing that uh, Representative Buzz and the other ones can do is outlaw gain of function, outlaw all of these things, and go at them and make them defend themselves. And I think there's it's indefensible and we win more. Yeah. Yeah. When I was labeled the moron of the year in 2013 by the Huffington Post <laughs> for teaching absence education in the National Schools, um, guess who came after me? The head of the Vanderbilt Monroe Carroll Children's Hospital LGBTQ clinic. And she ended up being the head of the transgender tra uh, conversion clinic. She's the one who went on the news that night and just completely eviscerated. It's exposing. In 2019, I crashed. <laughs> I crashed the meeting in UAB for social work students. Yeah. And that was fun, by the way. She's, um, and they were talking about how they um, tricked the schools to get them in there. They went in to talk about bullying. And as soon as they got in there, all the abortion stuff like, came out. Well, so you've really got to watch it. They're not, because they're going to lie to you when I saw them. You're exactly right. They use other. Um, ideas like suicide prevention and anti-bullying to get in, and then all of this stuff comes to me, and that's really what they want. That's just their foot in the door. How can we do double? Do you have a senator on paying legislator who's supporting your bill? Yes. So you see, right? Yeah, there. Do you have a number on it, too? Not yet. No, we haven't dropped it yet. We're strategically waiting on the right time to drop that bill. Keep watching our updates because we'll be following this one closely. Yeah. Thank you very much. Mm. I just have another action group. Good never steering committee. Go. I just have a comment to add in my research for uh, Alabama's campaign. Just so you know, it is attached their training, direct training. So it's from Universal Unitarian Associations. Yep. Mm -hmm. They also have a camp in Lakeville, Arizona, where they're facilitating the virus. And so I'm saying, so, just a little tidbit about a passion. Well, and they're also funded by the Alabama Department of Health, yes. 
Alabama COVID relief funds and Alabama Parks and the Human Resources. That's where they're getting funds. Now, she is not here to, for me to say this, but I'm going to say this. Wouldn't you rather your tax dollars go to a program like this? You know, you need to work on this. I mean, the thing you work at your SRA program works with local show, uh, local state library. Yes. And so what I'm seeing here is that, you know, in some counties like Lauderdale County, we have looked this out. Every every city and every city and county school in our area has this SRA program. And so we're proud of that. But if this becomes a law, I think we need to get more involved so that with your local uh, Save a Life programs because they're kind of seeing help getting these perks. And I would think once we have that, I mean, how do we implement them quickly? Right. So we're working on fund, uh, starting a statewide coalition of all pregnancy resource centers and people like us. We're not a pregnancy center. We just do SRA education. But we train a lot of the ones here now in yeah. Tennessee. So we're working on getting a coalition of all of the SRA providers in the state so that we know who that is. And that's going to be in place by mid-June. Wow. Ahead of probably, well, they'll pass, but probably ahead of implementation. This is exciting. Uh, it is. Joy, thank you so much for sharing with us. You have such a great resource. Thank you. Many of the speakers that we had today are the types of speakers that we have in our action groups. So if you're not involved, um, if you go to our website, alabamaeagle.org, you can find, uh, yeah, I have to be down like this. Uh, you don't need to film me in some uh, You You can, um, up at the top, it says communities on our menu bar, and you can find an action group near you. And if there isn't one, you can talk to Iva and she'll help you start one in your area. Mm -hmm. Um, as we wrap up, it's getting awkward.